morning everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. It's, uh, it's great to be able to all meet together in this, this way. Um, I've been thinking this week as, as things change and uh, as we start to get differences in the, the lockdown process, how, um, how amazing it is that, that God's love doesn't depend on how we feel. It's not, it's not altered by our mood. Um, it's constant and we can depend on it. I'm reminded of the Rend Collective song that uh, has the line, what's true in the light is still true in the dark. And uh, we can always trust that God's love is always there. That remains constant. Our rock on which we can depend. And that's a great thing. Psalm 18 begins, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my saviour. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you, that we know that you are always there and we can depend on you. You never change. It doesn't matter how we feel. Your love is constant, and we can trust in you. We ask that you fill this worship with your spirit so that you may be in everything that we do work through the things that people have brought to work in us to change us and mould us thank you that we can trust in you thank you that you are here with us now Amen Amen Today's Bible reading is John, chapter 14, verses 15 to 21. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me any more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Amen. Welcome to the only show that reuses your old candles, wax crayons, string and glass jars. Obviously, this is none other than Rosie's Upcycle programme. tells us that we are to be transformed. What? Like a transformer? 
like that Gratiol half-used candle you made your rainbow candles into. Oh, I'd like to be transformed into something with wings or have legs so, like a frog so I can jump up high to the sky. In nature, caterpillars are transformed like that. I know, it's called metamorphosis. You told me yesterday, otherwise I wouldn't have interrupted. I'd also like to be transformed to have BFG ears. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, back to the point. Hang on, I'd also like to have super turbo legs so I can climb Helvellyn in five minutes. Okay, but I don't think people go through metamorphosis. Oh, my lifelong dream ruined. At least not on the outside. But on the inside? Well, when you follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. And he gets to work, changing the way you think, how you feel, how you act. What, all at once? That's a bit much. Bit by bit. He changes you every day to be a little bit more like Jesus. That could take a long time. Yes, your whole life. What? But the result could be amazing. Come on. Welcome to the Cake Factory! Today we are making butterfly buns. To remind us. That we are to be transformed by the Holy Spirit's power and... We trust in Jesus and say yes to him. Yes. Okay. Knife. Circle. Then we're going to cut this bit in half. And fill the centre with some icing. You may need to use your fingers. And then you pop the wings on, like so. And there you have a butterfly. Fly, fly. Beautiful. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving me so much. Please change my heart, my thoughts and my actions to be more and more like you. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to live inside of me. Amen. Hello. Sometimes newspapers and magazines do a series of what's called a makeover, showing pictures before and after of a particular event. It might be a whole new way of dressing, makeup and, and clothes for someone. It might be a complete renovation of a house. It might be a transformation of a garden, turning it from a wilderness to a paradise. I want to, to think a bit about that with the disciples, the before picture, before Christ's death and resurrection, and the after view. And then have a look at us in this time of lockdown and consider how things might be in the future. I guess it's a bit like dipping in and out of Doctor Who's TARDIS. Some of you, perhaps with my age, might remember the very first time with those children discovering the battered old police box along with all the junk and then discovering that William Hartnell was the very first Doctor Who. Well, let's dip into the TARDIS and see where we come out. So this is our first stop. We emerge. We are in Jerusalem. It is the early part of the first century AD and we found ourselves in the upper room. There is Jesus and the disciples and a few others. It is Passover time, so they shared the Passover meal and apparently in the middle of it, before we arrived, Jesus knelt down and washed his friend's feet, mm, causing considerable shock. And then he went on to share bread and wine, sharing it, fragmenting the bread, passing it to each, as if somehow in symbolism he was showing them how the future would be, broken, shared, available. But what we notice most of all is the atmosphere. It's difficult, strained, one or two little moments of nervous laughter, sometimes topics that were perhaps better left unvoiced. But there's concern, anxiety. 
In a way, this isn't sudden. For if we, today, slip back to John chapter 11, remember that Jesus and his disciples were well away from Jerusalem and Bethany when he had the news that his dear young friend Lazarus was dying. But Jesus didn't go to see him. The disciples were glad, of course, because the last time Jesus had been anywhere near, they threatened to stone him. Their precious Jesus! How could they? And yet they were concerned that he wasn't going. After a few days, Jesus was adamant, now was the time to go and see Lazarus. But this caused the disciples' concern. And Thomas, who, it seems to me, never quite wastes his words, said, Then let us also go with him, that we may die with him. And the rest, as you might say, is history. We know they went, and we know that Lazarus was raised to life again. But then, if we remember that we're here in the upper room, only a short while before, Jesus had been explained that he would have to go and leave them, and where he was going, they couldn't come. Peter was put out, dear Peter. He was often put out. But Lord, he said, why can't I come? I would lay down my life for you. So in those two glimpses, we have a set of disciples who are concerned. There is risk ahead. How exactly is this going to work out? What is going to happen? So there we are, in the upper room, after all the eating's been done, and Jesus is talking. And knowing Jesus, he's trying to reassure them. He'd said, don't let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You believe in God, but believe also in me. And then now he said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Keep on doing what I've shown you, what I've taught you. Keep living the way I've shown you how to live. Don't let go of that. Hold fast to that. Then he'd spoken about not leaving them alone as orphans, saying, I will send you another helper. And he'd used the Greek word parakletos. Doesn't mean a lot to me or probably to you, but they would have understood. Paraclete, someone who'd stand by them, who'd speak for them, who'd reassure them, guide them, encourage them, support them, be there for them. Oh, perhaps this was hopeful. Maybe they were thinking this would be another man, a sort of another Jesus figure. But Jesus explained he would be the spirit of truth. Spirit, ah yes. They did understand spirit. They'd experienced Jesus' spirit when they'd gone out in twos. He'd sent them out to preach and teach and heal. And wow, what a difference it had made. But each time they could go back to Jesus, the man, their hero, and tell him everything, shared the laughter and the surprises. But it seemed Jesus was saying, he, the physical man they'd loved, wouldn't be with them. How would life be? How would they cope? And of course now as we know today, just a few hours later, Jesus was nailed to the cross. And as Jesus would known would happen, Their world came crumbling down. Everything they were certain of suddenly in chaos at their feet. And they didn't quite know how the world would look. How it would be in the future. How they would be. The world surely would be a very different place. So let's step back into the TARDIS at this point with those thoughts and those words in our minds. Little time travel, but not going far. For again, we're in Jerusalem, and it's just a few weeks later. But life's very different. For now the disciples have met the risen Christ. He's met them, he's met the two on the road to Emmaus, and in the weeks that followed, in different places, and surprisingly and suddenly, he would appear to hundreds of sometime believers and followers. Why did that leave them? Well, still uncertain how life would be. But the various visits, the conversation with Jesus on the, on the beach, had somehow filled them with a hope and a conviction that, well, if Jesus could really triumph over death, guilt, hate, sin, surely 
Surely then there was nothing more to fear, nothing that could ever separate them from God and his love. So that must have filled them with op optimism. In spite of not knowing quite how life would be, there was something of Jesus within them, something of the Spirit was there, even before the outburst at Pentecost. There was something infectious and irresistible, like the very love of Christ himself, that was in them and tentatively wanting to spill out to others. They couldn't keep this to themselves. The world was a different place. They would never have imagined it could be like this. So let's step back into the TARDIS again. And this time it's our third place. We've moved quite a bit now in space and time. But then that's the way the TARDIS works. For now we're in Britain. The year is 2020. It's springtime. It's not long after the Jews still celebrate their Passover. Not long after Christians celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And yet life is very different. We've stepped out of the TARDIS, yes, and there are no Daleks. There are no monsters from outer space. There's just a killer virus unleashed in the world, killing hundreds of thousands. We call it a pandemic. We're struggling. Are you struggling? I'm hoping, as I ask you this today, that you can say you've been fine, you've kept well. Bright as a button. All right, that's good. I'm pleased for you. It may be that some of you have had the virus at one degree or another, but have come through it, and I'm glad for you. Praise God that you're well again. Maybe like me, some of you have lost a friend to coronavirus. My friend's wife had to stay at home. She couldn't be by his hospital bedside couldn't hold his hand, couldn't kiss him goodbye. It was hard. Maybe some of you even read about the nurse who told her story working in a busy London hospital on Easter Saturday, how after 28 years of amazing experience, she was the nurse in one of the ICU wards. She'd struggled all day on her shift with the other medics, doctors, everybody working frantically to do what they could. There were eight seriously ill patients. They'd battled for hours all day right at the end of her shift. And in spite of her 28 years, she went home and all eight had died of the coronavirus. In spite of her experience, for the first time in 28 years, she sat down and she wept. Everything they'd done seemed to be to no avail. So maybe you who are watching today have escaped lightly and we've been okay, but others have been in what seemed like a hellhole for them. Perhaps like those disciples, wondering how on earth the world would be, how life could improve, what would happen. Maybe some of you are feeling as though you're in a hell hole, but for quite a different reason. Your pain and your struggle, your uncertainty, not sure what lies ahead. I wonder what Jesus would be saying. My guess is he would be saying what he said to those disciples. He would look at them with love in his eyes and he would say, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Believe in God and believe also in me. And then he'd say, if you really love me, keep on doing what I commanded. Remember my teachings. Remember all I've shown you. Remember to live the way I lived. And then perhaps he'd say, hold fast to my promises. We think of those lovely promises. Yes, do not be afraid. But also the fact that he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or perhaps we remember 
the comments he made in Matthew 28 to the disciples, a final word, and he said, I am with you to the end of the age. Our Lord will not leave us or forsake us, whether it's coronavirus, loneliness, despair, or something quite different. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. When he looked at you, he looked at you as though you were the only one in the world and he was willing to die for you. He will not let you go now. He has reserved a place for you in eternity with him. But how will the world be in spite of trusting Jesus? Let's step back into the TARDIS for our fourth and final journey. We come again, stepping out into Britain. And the year is 2021, or maybe 2022. The pandemic is behind us. We have a wonderful vaccine now, thank God, that's available should it ever rear its head again. But what can we look forward to? What might there be in that year or two years' time? I have five suggestions. See what you think to them. The first begins with a C. I would say it's creation, creatures. I was amazed when I discovered that the cruise ships had come to a standstill. We knew they had to do that. And I was glad they had. Don't get me wrong. I've loved the cruises I went on with my husband. Three, no, four. But when they stopped going into Venice... Suddenly the waters around Venice in the canals became clear. Fish returned and even dolphins were seen in the canals of Venice. Let us learn some hard lessons, bring in perhaps new instructions, new rules and guidelines so that we have respect again for God's creation and creatures. Perhaps God's trying to teach us that. We need to look afresh how we treat his world. The second thing also begins with the sea, and that's climate and cars. And I'm ashamed to say, before the lockdown, I was using my car at times when I really didn't need to. I've discovered during lockdown that when I needed to really go into town, on one occasion to the bank, make sure I could pay the bills, I walked from where I am in Scorby. It was only three miles, and it took me only an hour. And after my visit, I was able to walk back another three miles. Again, only another hour. Lovely walk along the railway, the old track. I've decided, when lockdown's over, and I'm back doing my bit on a Wednesday morning at Westbury Church in the coffee bar, I shall walk, set up at eight. I can get there, do my stint, and then perhaps come back on the bus. I shall still use a car from time to time, keep in touch with family, miles away, but I can use it less. We should be kinder on the climate. I wouldn't suggest we get rid of cars altogether. After all, we still need a car industry, and I wouldn't want to see hundreds of thousands of workers out of work. But we can use them less, perhaps more sensibly. And after all, the extra exercise we've discovered mean practising would probably mean we're more healthy and need to visit the doctor a little less. So, creatures and creation, climate and cars. The next two are the letter N. The first are neighbours. Do you know, there are some who admit in very busy areas that they've never actually met or talked to their neighbours before. We have now. We've learnt new kindnesses, new ways of reaching out. It was Jesus who said... The most important commandments are this, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbour as yourself. Bit of a paraphrase, but you know what I mean. Perhaps we need to learn about bringing that love for neighbour back to the forefront again. So my fourth one is N, NHS. It's very sad that it's taken a pandemic for us to realise How precious the NHS is. And by NHS, I mean not just nurses, but doctors, all those who work in any way, any form of medic, 
those in the background, those who keep it clean and provide the meals, those who work in that industry, out in community as well. It's going to cost us if we really find them precious. It's going to cost more in taxes. But I think it's taken the pandemic to show us how precious the NHS is. We must be prepared, I think, to give them the money, the resources and the respect they deserve. So my fifth and final one is IT. Hmm, not my strong point, but I pay tribute to those who are novices who've suddenly discovered how to Zoom for the first time or get involved with taping things and being in touch. All the organisations who've managed to keep in touch from novices right down to the web streaming maestros who've done so much, not least in acts of worship. It's been wonderful and I say thank you to everybody who's helped us in worship to enjoy and keep in touch and share in some way. But it comes with a but and it is a big but. My but is this. I believe we should never stop coming together as a worshipping community. Whatever you call a church building, whether it's a little country chapel, a modern extended church building, a grand cathedral, one of the mud huts in Africa, or perhaps just borrowed upstairs rooms above a supermarket, we need to still be God's worshipping community and come together with prayer and praise, learning and love as we come with one another to open ourselves up to God. Which brings me back to God, of course. What is God doing? What will God do in the future? Do you know the word new occurs something like 40 times in the Old Testament and around 58 in the New. Our Lord is one who's constantly doing something new. Just a handful of expressions I, I came upon, verses that I was looking through. Uh, one was uh, Psalm 40 and the writer said the Lord had put a new song in his mouth. Isaiah 43, the Lord says, I am doing a new thing. It is rising up. Can you not see it? Jeremiah 31, 31, where the Lord says, I'm going to make a new covenant. And he did. What he's done in Jesus is our new covenant. Then Jesus said, John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Paul said in Romans 6 verse 4, The Lord went to the cross and rose again so that we may have newness of life. We are, as fellow Christians, new creations. And of course, Revelation 21 verse 5, at the end of time, we saw the vision that John experienced and he shared it with us to say, Jesus, the Lamb, the judge on the throne, king of kings and lord of lords, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. I believe our Lord will be doing several new things as we recover from the pandemic. Not exactly sure what or where or with whom, but it just might be with you or maybe even me. I encourage you to keep open to whatever God might want to do. Keep praying, keep hoping, keep trusting, keep watching and being ready. Keep well. God bless. Good morning. Let everything that has life, light, let everything that has breath give all glory and honour and praise to the one who overcame death. Let every living thing sing of the mercies of our God. Let us exalt him wherever we live with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. If we do not praise him, the mountains will. If we do not exalt him, the rocks will cry out in our stead. God is not dead. Let every living thing sing of the mercies of our God. Let us exalt him wherever we live with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. 
and let us now for a moment relax and settle our minds and hearts as we enter more deeply into ourselves and begin to listen to God's Spirit speak to us. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Let us breathe deeply, slowly and quietly, remembering that every breath is a gift of God and is a sign of his love and of his Spirit's presence with us. Lord, as we breathe, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise and our heartfelt thanks. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, enter our silences. Come, Holy Spirit, and make all things new. Come, Holy Spirit, into the depths of our longings and sustain our weaknesses. Enter our trusting, our fearing. Enter our letting go and our holding back. Come, Holy Spirit, embrace and free us. Holy Spirit, come. And this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Father, we thank you for the joy that your word brings, the comfort and the encouragement, the counsel, wisdom, knowledge, the conviction and correction. Lord, we want to say we love you. We can't climb a mountain of that highest love and say we've reached the peak. It's a lesser love that we claim, and that might even be questionable. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit to empower us to keep your commands, just as Jesus instructed. Holy Spirit, we come and ask you to come and fill every part of our lives. Show us those things we do that are not obedient to Christ. Holy Spirit dwelling within, enable us to be obedient to Christ's call that we might walk in truth and love you more. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. We give you our thanks for our church at Burniston and all its people. We thank you for its mission, that it continues, though we cannot meet at present for worship. And following the church's plan of strategic prayer, our focus this Sunday is on teaching and worship. Hebrews 4 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord, your spirit leads us to believe and trust in you. So we give you thanks for the opportunities we find to grow in our faith. Bless, guard and guide our preachers, teachers and leadership teams in their ministry among us. We commend them to you, Lord. We pray for the worship band and AV technicians. The Bible studies in home groups, junior church, rock club, messy church and the boys brigade. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. Bless, Lord, our outreach of pastoral love and care. We pray your blessing on our neighbours and friends and families, particularly for those who do not know you. Help us through your spirit to reflect your love for them. May your presence surround and sustain them. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. Lord, we ask your protection from the spread of the coronavirus. Lord, we pray for a swift end to this virus. Sovereign Lord, nothing is too hard for you. And we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. Lord, we pray for our complex world, for the fragile equation of rich and poor, of have and have not. We pray for the needy throughout the world. Many are already living with reduced health resilience because of extreme poverty, or in overcrowded camps and in countries which do not have healthcare infrastructures needed to combat, combat widespread disease. As we come to the end of Christian Aid Week, let us pray for the Lord's protection on those who are continuing their work with people living in poverty. We pray for your blessing on all who are hungry, 
homeless or displaced, for the asylum seeker and refugee, for the mother who cannot feed her children, for the parents who cannot find work. We pray for all those who seek justice, freedom and peace, and all who work for her to make a safer world for us to live in. In your love and mercy, grant them endurance, peace and the resources they need and help us to respond to do all we can. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. Lord of peace, we pray for those living in the COVID-19 hotspots and those currently in isolation. Lord, may they know your presence in their isolation, your peace in their turmoil, and your patience in their waiting. Lord, you are powerful and merciful. Protect, strengthen them, we pray. For those who are elderly or have underlying health conditions that may make them susceptible to the coronavirus, Lord, we ask for them protection from infection. For those infected and those who have been exposed, grant them strength and healing, we pray. And for their loved, one, loved ones and carers, Bless them with your peace and comfort and endurance. God of all comfort and counsel, we pray for those who are grieving, reeling from the sudden loss of loved ones. May they find your fellowship in their suffering, your comfort in their loss and your hope in their despair. We name before you those known to us who are vulnerable and scared, the frail, the sick, the elderly and those suffering loss of a loved one. God of all comfort, you are powerful and merciful. Be with them. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. You're a God who heals. Lord, we pray for all medical professionals dealing with the intense pressures of this crisis. Grant them resilience in weariness, discernment in diagnosis, and compassion upon compassion as they care. For all healthcare employees and care workers, grant them strength and wisdom by your life-giving spirit, resources for their tasks, and protect them from infection. We thank you for researchers working steadily towards a cure. Given clarity and the blessing of an unexpected breakthrough today, we pray. We thank you for the recent discovery of a possible blood test. Would you rise above this present darkness as the sun of righteousness with healing in your wings? Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. God of all wisdom, we pray for our leaders, the World Health Organization, national governments, the local leaders too. Since you have positioned these people in public service for this hour, we ask you to bless them with wisdom beyond their wisdom to contain this virus, faith beyond their own faith to fight the fear, and strength beyond their own strength to sustain vital institutions throughout this time of turmoil. Spirit of all wisdom and counsel, grant them sound minds, courage and humility. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Lord, we love you. You know we love you. Lord, your unfailing providence sustains the world we live in and the life we live. Grant that we may never forget that our common life depends upon each other's toil. For those who must work despite the threat of sickness, grant them protection and continued provision. For those who have become unemployed or underemployed, grant them comfort, wisdom and financial provision. Lord, we pray for those having to make difficult decisions about their return to work this week against the backdrop of this unknown virus. For work, place decisions. For education, authorities, head teachers and teachers, for parents having to make decisions about their children, grant them your peace. And for the young ones too, grant them protection from fear. For all key workers and the services they provide, who have kept and continue to keep this nation moving, shopkeepers, postal 
services, refuse collectors, transport workers and all carers. There are so many to name them all. Lord bless and protect them. Lord look upon them and show your grace and favour. Give them your peace. Lord we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you that your Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we don't know what we should say, your Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. Lord, may we find the joy of the Lord even in the midst of our trials. We pray that you would teach us what it means to see beyond our troubles, knowing that your Spirit is with us. Even so, Lord God, we see the challenges those around us are facing. We ask you to intervene and to prompt us to participate with you as you care for your people and most of all to restore creation and make all things new. We pray that we would not be anxious but that you would give us your peace. Let us live differently in the midst of trial so the world might see you in us. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. So let us go with confidence in the days ahead, trusting in God's unfailing love and faithfulness. God will not abandon us, for we are the work of his hands, his own creation, and his love endures forever. God's spirit to lead us, God's spirit to hold us, God's spirit to enfold us in his embrace. So go with his joy, go in his peace, go in his love. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus.